Okie dokie. Uh, I think I know all of you. So I'm Richard Alomar. I'm the department chair, and I'm also the director of the graduate program. Uh, great to have you folks here this morning. So if we could just go around the room, I mean, those are fairly quick to introduce. Uh, so my name is Richard Jave. I'll reintroduce myself for the presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the full, the full. But uh, I'm just <laughs> yeah, I'm Alistair Vinnie. I'm uh, interested in the program as a, as a potential student. I retired recently from my corporate career when I was quite square for my next chapter. Hello, I'm Diana Bork. I'm an MLA chair for the year. I've completed my coursework and I'm working on a thesis. Uh, John, I'm a prospective student in the MLA program. And I mean, <laughs> you're, so, you're supportive of, uh, of Sean. That's great. So today we'll, um, we're just going to do a couple of things. I'll give, give you a general overview of the program. Uh, and then Vincent, Anita, and Diana will uh, give you a little uh, a presentation on their work and the work that they're doing, both as faculty and as uh, as a graduate students, and then we'll just walk around the lake, take a look at the work and stuff, uh, facilities that we have, and then we'll put it from there. Sound good? Okay. Um, so as a department, we have a core belief. We have a core belief that when you combine science with people and you use it in a sort of, uh, uh, you use design research as a method of, of of understanding both, you can create a better future for people. Very nice. Thing, right? It's all about people, it's all about land, it's all about the ground. That's how we uh, deal with things. Since we are in a, um, in a school of environmental and biological sciences, our sort of um, outlook or approach towards landscape architecture is a little different than those in um, the design school. We're very heavy on science, very heavy on research very heavy on critical thinking. It doesn't make it any less creative. It doesn't make it any less fun, uh, but it's still good. We have some core values, stewardship, creative solutions, and change. Stewardship is stewardship of the land. We're committed to working with other people, other disciplines, other community groups. Creative solutions, we embrace the fact that we are in a science school and we do art, right? So we use that to create a creative solution and change. We're not afraid of the future, right? The future, uh, you know, as I like to say, the world has been ending since the world started and it still hasn't ended. So there's still a, a possibility. Some basics about Rutgers. Rutgers is a colonial college. It was established in 1766. It was known back then as Queens College. Same time the King College was uh, started, which is now known as Columbia. <clears throat> At SEBS, uh, again, this is a this is a science school, biochemistry, ecology, entomology, environmental sciences, and that's where we fit in, where we're housed. Uh, currently, we have about seventy undergrad students, thirty graduate students, roughly twenty faculty and staff. We have a master's program in landscape architecture, a bachelor's of science in landscape architecture, and a bachelor's in environmental planning. That's our our main. Um, we have two different master's programs, the MLA-1 and the MLA-2. MLA-2 is for folks who already have a bachelor's in landscape architecture. MLA-3 is for folks who have a bachelor's in something else, right? Um, it's a professionally accredited program, and it has been for quite a while, meaning that when you graduate from here, you're able to work and to get licensed. Uh, for the MLA-1 program, it's basically three years of study. Um, if you have a background in something related to landscape architecture, architecture, engineering, or something like that, there are some, there's a possibility of getting some credits uh, waived uh, to, to, to ease the burden of it. Uh, the first year is incredibly intensive. It's studio work, it's uh, computer graphics and stuff, but you can get through it. Diana will attest to. 
Uh, second year is studio work, and third year is mostly your thesis and your research work. Any questions, Sean? No. You guys are good? Opportunities. Um, we do have uh, assistantships available for second and third year students. Uh, and that's, you get a tuition remission plus a small stipend with that. There's also hourly research with faculty members, with the Office of Urban Extension and Engagement, and with CUES. Uh, there's also a series of scholarships and awards um, uh, that, are, that are given out. Um, there is a connection between um, us and New Jersey ASLA chapter. Uh, the New Jersey ASLA chapter, that's the New Jersey chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects, has their yearly conference in January, February. And I think, I believe it's the second largest chapter conference in the nation. 600 some odd people show up. Uh, our graduates and undergraduate students participate actively in that, not only as uh, you know, being in the um, in the conference and watching uh, the lectures and stuff, but also meeting potential employers, uh, potential connections. There's a lot of network. A lot of the work that we do, either through um, faculty or through studio work, is there's a big community engagement uh, component to it. Uh, there's a lot of outreach that goes out, and there's also much for you there, Sean. Uh, there's a lot of design, build, construction stuff that we do on the site. We, we can go around and take a look. Right. Not only in and around uh, the campus, but also outside. Um, so it's fairly easy. Just go online, apply. Uh, give us your give us your best stuff, and then we'll take it from there. Um, the hardest or the most questions we get about it is the portfolio. The portfolio is just, um, the portfolio, you should just see it as a narrative of your thinking process, right? Don't look at it as needing to be anything more than showing us how you think and how you solve problems, right? We've had a variety of different types of, uh, of uh, portfolios. Uh, we received a musical score from someone who had a bachelor's in, uh, in music. Interesting. Interesting, right? We receive, we've seen um, uh, somebody who liked to bake cakes. So they gave us a whole recipe and the whole process, which is quite interesting because it does show the design process and the whole sort of thing. So that was quite exciting to see. Someone who liked to do, um, uh, someone who was uh, like to design purses and bags. So they showed us that sort of thing. People who are engaged in photography, they show us a lot of that sort of thing. Um, so those are the things that are available. Um, um, for you to show in the portfolio. It's a it's an electronic submission. Um, if you need any more information, that's what I'm here for. Just contact me. Just contact Gail, and we will be able to walk you through the process. Okay. And I believe that that's it for me. Okay, so um, as I've introduced myself earlier, I'm Diana Borg. I'm a third year MLA candidate in the program. Um, I signed up for the program and, and well, I was going through this process in 2018. Um, I took studio and another class in 2019 and 2020 COVID happened. Um, I come from a background in community-based healthcare. So about a week before COVID, I got to reopen an LGBTQ youth clubhouse space, and I was really living my dream. I was working in social justice. I was working in spatial justice, and I was also engaged in classwork here. And I thought all of this was going to be to the betterment of, of kind of my journey and understanding more about spatial disparities and, and what could be done and that change was possible. Um, through uh, a series of, series of courses, I landed on this thesis topic. So I'm going to kind of dip in and out of like convincing you of my, my thesis, but more in, in, in a little bit about how, how it kind of came to be and that the coursework will, will supplement your, your ultimate work, um, not only what you do professionally, um, but also um, kind of your personal quests and um, the classes that you'll eventually choose to take here. I think I just used the arrow. All right, 
So um, my investigation um, is about uh, roads and um, and them as sort of a racialized carceral landscape and what aspects of roads um, contribute to that. I, the questions that I was trying to answer was whether road infrastructure, um, uh, what role does it have in the carceral landscape? How does it contribute to the carceral landscape in New Jersey? Um, what those contributing factors may have been in fatal encounters between police and civilians? And then also what data and methods, and I, I would say a good chunk of the work is about methodology and how do you arrive at, at these things and what tools um, you could use to evaluate um, such instances. Um, I'm going to present just a couple of sections of this is sort of what a sort of chapter outline could look like. Um, and we're not going to get time to go through all of it. So I'll just try to give you a little bit of a context of how I got there um, and how I utilized some of the tools I learned in the program to, to start um, my journey and then uh, kind of where I landed with it. Um, so to talk a little bit about context, um, uh, there's a lot of historical research, um, kind of going back to a, a book that was written, Good Roads and Convict Labor, um, of which New Jersey was one of the states to use convict labor to develop its, its road infrastructure. Um, it also was the first state, um, uh, the state government that started paying for paving roads, which was actually a, a big deal at the time, um, and explains a lot about why the roads really tend to dominate the landscape um, in New Jersey, and, and a lot of it having to do between you know us being located between two very um, critical cities. Um, we also I also touch a little bit on maintenance costs. Um, New Jersey and I think a lot of uh, a lot of sort of civilians in New Jersey have criticism about the cost of roads. Um, it is a really big expense um, in our overall state budget. And then I start to get into um, other things that are that are more present day issues that have come, come more to light, although have been happening for a long time, like sort of this idea of taxation by citation. Um, and that New Jersey generates 400 million in annual citations, um, much of which is, is sort of gets redirected back to municipalities um, towards roads, towards policing, towards other things, but a lot of this with very little to any oversight. Um, and I think this this sort of leads up to a lot of a lot of um, challenges and lack of trust that communities have about how their roads are managed, um, as well as um, uh, the presence of law enforcement in these public spaces. Um, I talk a little bit about driving while black and what that what that what that means, what that term means, what it refers to, what data is available in New Jersey and not available, and what's been kind of opaque and not transparent up until somewhat recently. Um, and I, in the sort of context setup of this, I actually talk a lot about data because in landscape architecture, we do use a lot of data. Um, I'll show you some mapping that could only have been created with, with coordinates. Um, and I think that there's a lot of critical thinking in the program about when and how you use data and what that what that means, um, the power of it, who has access to it, who doesn't. And this particular topic, not only do I argue that it is very much a place-based land struggle, um, is also uh, data seems to be at this sort of crux of, of, of tension um, that has come, uh, you know, for many, many years, so much so that there are, you know, Stanford open policing, um, Washington Post, uh, mapping police violence, um, a lot of institutions like academia and media um, and, and, and sort of the nonprofit world has been trying to make data as, as transparent as possible. And so when you go to these sites, there's a lot of open source data. And so as someone researching this, you know, uh, considering open source data as, as an opportunity for you to also engage with material um, in some way. Um, there's also been a lot of uh, research done about like how, how, how good is this data? Like, what does it really mean? Um, uh, and some comparisons, but I, I ended up landing on fatal encounters, um, which the University of Southern California is now um, is now engaged with. Although at the time when I was using it, um, the data scientist was more or less on his own, um, and it's because uh, the data that that he was making available was of over a twenty year time span. Um, and these are a number of fatal encounters um, each of these years, and kind of showing those those trends. Um, and that's when I, I started to engage in GIS work uh, during a Praxis Studio class uh, in 2021, um, to kind of looking at where fatal encounters were happening, that they really, they really mapped out New Jersey, um, you know, without any any boundaries indicating. You could tell what state you're in, basically, how it looked against law enforcement facilities. Um, and then I also looked at how it looked against major roads, and I define major roads as um, state, county roads, as well as interstate roads. Um, and there's sort of a lot of things around road classification. So, um, 
you'll you'll also be overwhelmed by data <laughs> in this program. And again, it's it's about really looking at um uh, and and kind of distilling down to what what is what is uh, pertinent to your to your work. Um, and then you know the, there's there's other issues with with data, and and this is this is one of the one of the things related to um, to this being a place based struggle. Also, is that that oftentimes race is not very clear in these instances. So if you look at the number of you know um, you know African American black, but then also race unspecified, and then this came up several times through police reports and. Attorney General's office um, reports and other things, and so so that in itself, when things are missing, are also clues to to why is it missing, and, and uh, bring up more questions. Um, but overall, 24% of these encounters were vehicular related. So that means the Washington Post tracking gunshots were not necessarily tra tracking those that were that were the highest level use of force was actually the vehicle itself, um, and that to me, I think. Um, I think it, it sort of encapsulates the roads as much more a contributor to these factors than, than just this sort of standalone passive thing that happens in the landscape. Um, the way that the, the road enacts is enacted in, in these sort of fatal encounters, in these sort of very high tense moments between law enforcement and civilians is also a contributing factor to it. Um, and so I drilled down into over, this is just 42, but I ended up actually investigating over, over 46 of them. Um, uh, of different encounters. I go to the sites, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And also in context, I do talk about 2020. Um, what happened before 2020, what legislation or policing or policy was, was in place, and then what was sort of happening during, um, during these instances, and we give a little context. Um, as well as I, I talk a little bit about a 1968 report prior to the Lilly report um, of uh, the riots that took place in um, in Newark in, in, in the 60s, also in Camden, some in Patterson, lesser known. But it, it sort of helps give a little bit of context to the policy story, like why all of a sudden certain politicians are, are you know, talking about these things and how these policies, again, I, I sort of talk a lot, a lot about them being land-based as well as road-based. So even in this report, they're talking about abandoned buildings, they're talking about dirty streets, they're actually talking about the like material qualities of the road as being a contributor to the violence and to what happened in the 60s. So the fact that we find ourselves again in this space um, is, is, is context, but also doesn't really give us answers either. Um, so in mediums and messages, this is where I really dive more into the methodology because again, there's a lot of data. So how do you determine what you're going to really hone in on? And um, there are a few, few things that I, I really, really kind of hooked into. One is, um, and I, I believe this to be true in, from the moment I you know, explore the topic to then deciding it was going to be a thesis um, uh, journey is 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 sort of the the point of view, um, and and that being one that I think is very self reflective and one that I think is also important to anyone's um, MLA experience um, and sort of who I was as a researcher, and so I, I really kind of focus more on the feminist political ecology. Um, I. I I knew this already from working in nonprofit spaces and, and grassroots organizations that I was interested in everyday embodied and emotional aspects um, of not, you know, nature society. Previous work was about healthcare and society and space, but these things are very related. Um, but I think in this particular article, it also talks about there that, you know, this kind of FPE approach also opens up a lot of different types of methodologies. It almost means like you have a lot of things in your toolkit that in itself can be um, overwhelming and confusing. But ultimately, the, the kind of the, the mean to the ends is really about looking towards transformative justice, looking towards, as, as Richard had said, change. You know, how do we finally get that conversation to a space of, of change? Um, and so I highlight a couple of things, you know, besides kind of the embodied and emotional aspects of, 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 of the look, I also look at a kind of affected geographies, relationality, um, multiplicity. So sometimes I'll look at an instance, but I'll look at like what was covered in the media versus what was covered in social media from the family members versus what might have happened later and then versus what the press release stated from the attorney general's office. Um, and so I sort of do like little comparisons um, between these things and trying to reveal the invisible, but complex. Um, but there's one other really interesting thing in the way that Sultana breaks out FPEs that actually part of, part of like, you know, feminist political ecology is also believing that this is an advancement in methodologies, that this mixing of qualitative and quantitative, that it's not just 
for no reason. It's really trying to push the conversations into spaces that haven't been before. Um, and I think that's really, really, you know, ambitious sometimes, but but also very necessary because these issues are really difficult to compli and complicated to talk about and could really like, I mean, I, there's a lot of reasons why students don't pursue this type of topic um, because I'm looking at like criminal justice, history, policy, and all these other other spaces to try to synthesize what what is what is um, very important um, and affecting so many people's lives. Um, so that uh, that there, I also get into um, landscape as a medium. Is, is this is Walter Hood's quote, which is actually a quote from another landscape architect, um, an editor of of magazine, um, and I'm blanking on her name, but she she uses this term for the first time talking about the kind of ecological associations. Um, I give some history to this being the medium is a message, which is which is um, uh, a term um, that was introduced around the time of the riots in the 60s. Um, and uh, I also talk a little bit about media as a landscape and how it creates this uh, kind of dialectic relationship between like the roads themselves to then the accounts of what these situations look like when they're being covered in the news and how that could affect um, individuals who are, who are you know, traveling these spaces. Um, and then there is a, uh, you know, a feminist historian from American University who wrote a great, great um, journal article about sort of um, the, the, the kind of, she calls it the stream of sadness, which is also like looking at these images through social media. So how that, he sort of com completes this virtual and physical experience of the road and, and brings even more attention into, into these scenarios. Um, the instance uh, that taking place during, during the time of this research around George Floyd, it also touched a little bit about, about how people experience the space itself um, and the, the memorial of, of, of what was happened, but, but not as so much as a memorial, but as a kind of an act of uh, resistance in and of itself. And eventually the sort of creative, um, the creative methodology that I decided to pursue was um, through photography. And I, I along with the, the studio, took a workshop in architectural photography, what that meant, um, and then set out to photograph each of these sites. So my last chapter is about um, sort of, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to quote you, Richard, in the conversation we had um, before before summer break, which was just like looking for sort of like what was what was the star of the scene, what was the critical character um, and and themes that I'm I'm sort of finding. I've taken almost you know four thousand five thousand photos. I do take a lot of photos; they're not all good, um, you know. Uh, I, I was doing overdraws and photos and starting to collage things, and it was almost a, a massive a visual material. But as I was reading the sort of text of the incidents, being in the space, understanding how roads do work and function and, and how they're supposed to function, when you know sidewalks are lacking, water drainage issues, all these other material qualities that we do experience and get a lot through our studies at the MLA program. Um, I did land on sort of this idea of ghosts and things that are seen and things that are not seen that seem to be at the pivotal point of these incidents. Um, so within it, the section ambiguous pursuits, um, I talk a little bit about this particular area between Woodbridge and and, um, and, uh, and Edison. And I mean, in the first image, I think you can see, you know, trucks going this way, trucks going this way. There are no lanes. There's no identifiers. This is a really, really dangerous place um, uh, to to travel. Um, but uh, I sort of I talk a little bit about the road itself, but also that the media accounts of this really focus on the fact that Odin was a High Rollers um, Black Motorcycle Club member. Um, didn't mention that actually in, in the research, which I was able to find online, is that he was like honors, you know, Columbia colonial um, high school graduate had immigrated to the states when he was three from Jamaica and he was on his way to Valvoline which is like a, you know an oil changing um, you know kind of like little uh, I wouldn't say mechanic shop but but he was the man of which he was the manager of. Um, and this incident happened at 10 a.m. on a Wednesday. Um, and so ambiguous pursuits talks a little bit about there's this ambiguity between like sometimes law enforcement turning lights on, turning them off, not knowing that you're being pursued or not being not knowing that you're being asked to pull over. And then what it's like to to then do something like that or instigate something like that in a space like this on, a, on an average Wednesday morning, um, as well as sort of the implied racism that that even in just the media accounts 
of it, like what it had to do with, with him being uh, a member of a black motorcycle club, which are social clubs also, you know, I mean, people should, you know, there's sort of other research there. Um, this, in, this particular site was interesting because I kept observing vehicles driving through, like there were only two stores that were not um, vacant at the time, and, but many vehicles kept driving through the lot and finally I, you know, made my way over there. And it, it the back to a whole residential area, as you can see in the far right area. So ambiguous pursuits also mean when there's ambiguity, not just in the roads, but in how people cut through these plazas can create tension and, and issues where there shouldn't be. Um, and clearly somebody put a plaza in the middle of a community, in the middle of a neighborhood, and thought that was that would net out okay. Um, and I, I don't want to keep focusing on law enforcement. And I think when we keep doing that, I think it tears us further and further away from, from change, but it would imply that they have a lot of, lot of um, they're given a lot of leeway into how, how law enforcement operates in public spaces and what they consider public or not. And, and um, this particular, uh, you know, officer was, you know, and again, it's like if these attempted, attempted, um, you know, pullovers um, was actually, uh, you know, was actually part of a $1.2 million settlement in Hamilton. He was an officer when this had happened. And this, this, you know, 2020, um, by the time this incident happened later that year or 2021, um, he was now a detective and he was also, the, the attempted pullover was in an unmarked vehicle and in, in plain clothes. So in big use pursuits also talks a lot about how um, law enforcement can sort of sort of not be clear that you're being followed by someone who's a law enforcement officer and that that also creates a lot of tension along with the roads you know like what's happening it's nine o'clock at night the ace hardware is clearly closed why is this person driving close behind me do i see lights or do i not see lights um uh, and so, uh, you know, there's other there's other aspects in big news pursuits that that do um, contribute to to these high tense and tense um, situations like the unmarked vehicles, um, like in the upper right. This is Ford's new edition. Um, this is an officer uh, who, so the, the body cam is 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 he's the officer wearing the cam is saying, "Why are you here?" He's explaining that we have a warrant, but it's like they actually don't have it on hand. Like someone has to deliver the warrant, but he's already on the personal property where this incident is taking place. And if you can, he looks very confused here. The officers explain to him why he shouldn't be there in the first place. Um, and, and, you know, this incident is now a criminal case, but, um, but it also talks a little bit about how law enforcement are, are, are sort of, they put in situations and sometimes even those who are trained are not, not really aware of of all the, you know, based on their years in the force or experience, are not really aware of what's going on, and that can also escalate a situation. Um, calls for help is, is a lot about mental health and substance use, and why why law enforcement would never necessarily be the answer um, to responding to these instances. There were there were a good majority of the fatal encounters were those, um, uh, and they led me to spaces like an abandoned mall. Um, where Voorhees invested millions in building this mall. Um, I would say like 80% of the stores are closed. They have the lights dimmed when you walk in. They have the mall music playing. It's a really, really strange thing. And what they try to do to kind of make up for this lap, uh, this kind of bad investment and bad development is then build this additional housing in the back. Um, and they also use spaces in the mall as like municipality offices. There's like a records ID place and they set it up as a COVID station, a parts of it. Um, but even traveling around, because you know you have your like just driving around these empty lots. I mean, I observed the vehicles going like 50 miles per hour in in a parking lot, and they probably if they had a reason to slow down, maybe they would have. But um, uh, but but you know, calls for help also talks a lot about about sort of sort of land and its relationship to development and settlement um, in that particular instance. In this, um, this was only about a, couple, a week after the eviction mortar, um, moratorium, I'm probably saying that wrong, um, was lifted. And uh, this individual, you know, was like, I'm not going to jail. But all of these, all of these cops had shown up actually to um, his door because they were going to serve an eviction notice, and so this this went really, really badly. Um, and then also calls for help, um, talking about an instance that actually happened on the hospital grounds, um, uh, and 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 I, yeah, and just sort of what spaces are safe, um, as well as uh, areas near contamination. All of these. Um, 
uh, all these cans were marked water dated um, May of 2022 or something. Um, and there's hundreds of them. So you say like this sort of between um, and Bayonne uh, kind of new development and sort of the older development is kind of behind me um, where this instance took place. So oftentimes, although these were coordinates and there are instances and things that had happened there, there were a lot of other land-based issues surrounding them. Um, ghost guns, I talk a lot about the effect of guns um, in instances. One thing I'll, I'll, I'll just highlight and then, and then wrap up is um, this is something called um, Shot Spotter. It's a technology that actually has been used here in, um, in New Jersey since 2014. It's, it's in every city, basically, and um, it's a series of uh, speakers and sounds. And according to the CEO, there's an algorithm that can detect when shots are being fired, and it directs law enforcement to that site. There are some, some really questionable cases right now of people being fal falsely um, convicted um, and or detained for these instances in other cities, um, but it's something that's not really been much talked about here in New Jersey. And I would say um, about three months ago, the governor has decided to double down on this technology and has invested more millions of dollars. I don't have the number off the top of my head in it. Um, and it's also um, one of the instances where there was a fatal encounter was supposedly a response to two shot caller. And that site was in um, Patterson. And again, there's sort of this, this, this sort of visual of the roads um, and, and this kind of uh, space of, of, of development and what development looks like in, in, in spaces like Patterson right now. Um, and uh, I talk a little bit also about what com the community of, 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 of Patterson, how they're responding to gun violence through mutual aid and through really like just taking over the streets. This is a harm reduction um, team that goes around passing clean needles and they literally do it like on the sidewalk and with, a, with a wagon, which is, I mean, completely radical <laughs> um, uh, for anyone who knows anything about, about harm reduction um, uh, sort of, sort of, uh, sort of methods. Um, so, but, but also just, just how the street itself can tell us a lot about a space and what a community may be going through. Um, the mayor actually tried to use um, $5.7 million of improvements. This is COVID money that went unused in Mayotte Patterson to, um, to, to fix their parks. They have a beautiful, like, Kind of, not beautiful, like an extensive park system with a lot of opportunity and, and a national park amidst it. Um, but that, that this is kind of at attention, right? Because, you know, really nice parks also mean more gentrification, more development, more other things. And this is uh, the community that was hit very hard by, by COVID, not only for those who might have been, um, been, you know, personally affected by the disease in, in, in health related reasons, but because there were a lot of service workers in Patterson who lost their jobs during the time of, of 2020. Um, um, and, you know, I, I talk a little bit about the mayor and, and, and this sort of military style look that he was sporting during, during these two years, which he stopped doing um, uh, just in time for, for the campaign earlier this year. So in sightings, I talk a lot about how the communities want to be seen. Um, these, are, these are shots from, from rallies. Um, how, how sightings is also about looking into situations a little bit more deeply. Um, that a lot of our law enforcement uh, officers are, 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 are becoming more diverse in New Jersey, and that's going to add a layer of complexity um, to, to what's going on, and that they find themselves in situations not necessarily equipped or handled, but are still part of a very colonialized and, and, and somewhat dangerous um, system. And so how, how, would they, how would they sort of manage um, some of these? Uh, um, and then I talk of, and then I, this is sort of where I end with it in sightings is, is um, really, again, going back to the fact that this is a place-based struggle um, and that, you know, the more emphasis we put on place and land, the more opportunities there are for change and, and opportunities for, for communities to not only talk about what they want is community control over policing. And what I really speak to is a community control over roads. And, and really seeing them as public spaces and public lands that, that, that you know, have, have hold enormous opportunity um, uh, for, for connection and, 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 and for safety. Um, Philly Peace Parks uh, is an example um, of one, there's two locations in the west and north side. And, um, you know, this is a quote from their ED. They do these things where they do these village walks and they gather like, a, you know, a bunch of individuals um, to walk the community every, every Friday. He has like a call to action. Like if we can just organize 10 people 
you know, once a week to do patrolling. And they're really talking about self-policing and, and self-patrolling of the streets um, and kind of increasing the presence um, of, of individuals um, in the community. And, you know, sort of what he sort of communicates is it shows you that we need to be there in our communities and an active security presence. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, this is a very, this is a transcript, a very, very emotional um, Facebook video that he released the, 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 the day of, of the walk that they had done. And he, he seemed particularly proud of, of the work they were doing. But again, it, it goes back to like, it's, they're obviously growing vegetables, they're feeding communities of produce, they're doing all these things, but they're really also talking about safety and security and talking about how they own that and could own that and be empowered to own it um, in their communities. Um, and then lastly, if it, just, to, just to mention is that uh, all work um, uh, should, should ask you to question your beliefs, um, question why you think the work is important, um, uh, be uncomfortable with all those answers. Um, that's another presentation um, from me uh, for another day, um, but also understanding that you yourself you know, are part of the landscape. Um, you know, how I present in these communities, where I go, what I'm doing, and I'm not just kind of invisible, you know, and, and, and neither is anyone a part of this program, and that that in itself is also something worth acknowledging, even if it doesn't make it in your thesis, but it's, it is part of that process too. That's it. Thank you. So like I mentioned, my name is Vincent Jave. I uh, am an assistant teaching professor here at the department. And so I thought maybe for the next uh, like 20 minutes or so, uh, I would just talk about practice, research, and teaching. Um, you know, specifically here at the department, I teach um, a lot of the computational design courses, like the visualization courses. So uh, I teach the two-dimensional uh, course, at least sort of half of it, uh, that you'll, you would certainly take in the MLA program. I also teach a three-dimensional one, uh, which I believe is optional to you. Um, and then I teach a construction two course, which thinks a lot about materials and assemblies, as well as a uh, regional planning um, course, generally that's themed around green infrastructure planning, um, design and prototyping. And a lot of my interest really circles around the, the threshold between digital and physical. Um, you know, the digital, both as a tool that we design with um, and the physical in terms of how how it, how it results in inputs in our design workflow, uh, as well as, of course, the output uh, of what we do in, in landscape architecture. Oh, space bar. Thanks. Uh, so I thought maybe just before I present uh, two projects that are recent work, just to give you a sense of like where I'm coming from and, and who I am. So I, uh, I'm Canadian and I studied at the University of Toronto, which is where I did my master's in of landscape architecture degree. And, you know, while I was there, I had the chance to work with a lot of uh, great, great thinkers, great, great programs. Um, so I worked with uh, Professor Fadi Massoud with the MIT Urban Risk Lab, which later became the Center for Landscape Research um, at the University of Toronto. I worked with North Design Office, which is a bit more traditional uh design and in this moment like design build practice when i was interning with them uh, i interned at west state in my sort of uh final summer break of the mla program there um and i also worked with the green roof information testing laboratory it's known as the the grit lab so thinking about uh green roof performance um using environmental um, monitoring of things like um like their ability to retain stormwater provide um habitat as well as um, control or mitigate the urban heat island effect. So I, I won't talk about it as much, but, uh, and then I also work with the inner outer space lab, which is a lot more sort of digital uh, fabrication based, uh, art based uh, work that I was doing with Professor Brian Boyd on. Um, once I graduated, I went back to West State and I sort of split my time between um, Rotterdam and New York. And, and so practice with them and, Right around the time, um, just a little bit before I was leaving West State to join here at Rutgers University, I, uh, my the principal of West State, Claire Augury, started her own practice in Baltimore known as Unknown Studio. And so I've sort of, you know, been working full time here um, as well as practicing with Unknown Studio. So my practice very much informs my teaching and research. And so, you know, the two projects that I'll talk about today um, you know, are sort of they 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 bridge these these 
uh, thresholds between practice and research and research and teaching. And so they all kind of inform one another. Um, the first thing I'll talk about is uh, Good Neighbor. It's a project that we did in, in Baltimore, Maryland, but that I presented just this past summer um, at the Digital Landscape Architecture Conference um, that was held uh, at, at Harvard. And um, the, the premise of the paper basically is, um, you know, this idea that like hobbyist drones are becoming uh, more and more accessible in the design process. And uh, I sort of was curious about our own working method at Unknown Studio in terms of using um, digital scanning as a low cost uh, site surveying measure, basically, and how that might be applied in a design process. And then also the ability for um, the drone scanning to actually be used as a kind of post occupancy review, meaning that once the design's been done, you know, you can sort of check in with your contractor and actually assess what's been built, how accurately it's been done, and how that could actually be a kind of um, means of learning between the designer and the contractor themselves. Uh, just kind of an overview of, of this Good Neighbor site. You know, one of the most important things uh, that we really needed accurate topographic information for is the relief from sort of one side of the street to the other. So it's about six point. Um, four meters of elevation change, if I remember correctly, so a lot. Um, and of course, that informs the design response to for, for the site. So just uh, a kind of overview then of really what was the outcome uh, of the paper in some way, which is a, a new kind of workflow and how you might incorporate a scan model. And you know, one of the most important things um, that became clear in, in this process was the need for abstraction of um, the, the coin cloud model. So I'll, call it, I'll kind of go through really quickly just those um, different moments in the design process, basically. So what you're looking at here is a, a mesh model of the, the scanned uh, site. The sort of like black grainy looking stuff is the point cloud data. And so all of the um, all of those points are basically triangulated to form one um, one mesh, and so this is kind of what the site looks like, you know. And and an important thing here is that it, it also it offsets the need for multiple site visits, at least from a kind of um, like ontological perspective, right? Like the sort of like spatial configuration of the space, um, you know, it doesn't do much for the the sort of like uh, experience on the ground of the space, but where things currently are. Um, it was really, really helpful for it. And so one thing, though, is most of the tools that we design with uh, don't lend themselves to manipulating a single um, mesh by way of design. And so there's this interesting moment where we're actually taking this information and compressing it flat, you know, back to 2D um, to have um, to sketch over right and to think about spatially. And so we actually went through that process and, and built up the model again uh, in a software called Rhino, um, Rhinoceros and Full. And, you know, again, there's this interesting moment where we're actually abstracting uh, a little bit the space and starting to, to define materiality of the site. So it's no longer just one mesh. It's actually a series of, of different materials, some of which will remain and some of which are, are sort of up for grabs, you know, in a kind of design um, sense. So just another look at 3D model there. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, we're also integrating then um, sketching with like tablets over top as well. So there's, again, this like moment of, of hand drawing, uh, digitized hand drawing in this case, and how that can sort of help you explain um, some of these subtle things that maybe the computer wouldn't get through, like in terms of this billboard, you know, that was part of really the design challenge in some ways uh, for this site, something that was not going to move. So these were the, the hand sketches for basically three schemes that we presented to the um, to the client, uh, Grand Terraces, the Piedmont Meadow, and Intimate Gatherings. And so these basically two-dimensional sketches that came out of the really drawing over top of our abstracted site plan, um, which came from the scan model, um, we started to model these in 3D. And so in the latter half of the three-dimensional um, design course here at Rutgers, we, we start to work with this software called Lumion um, to do renderings. And these are basically just really um, somewhat quick uh, visualizations of what these schemes could look like for the client to evaluate. And so the Grand Terrace, 
the Piedmont Meadow, and intimate gatherings. Ultimately, you know, and they all navigate the slope in different ways, which is sort of the most important takeaway in, in a way. They all had their own themes, but uh, the client opted for the Piedmont Meadow scheme, so this kind of um, switchback ramp, you know, to navigate that slope. And so we began to think a little bit more about programming the space. Um, a lot of these are just screen captures uh, in that 3D software I mentioned, and then just writing a written in uh, like Adobe Illustrator, which is another software you can learn here. Um, so just look at that programming, revising that scheme a little bit more with the switchbacks, as well as including a, a stair, you know, to expedite your way through the slope um, if you want. So look at some of those revised um, design drawings. It's like on the ground and the bird's eye view. This was sort of the full scope of the design project. And, you know, one of the things we were talking about early on was, you know, is the client going to go with the sort of like architectural intervention at the high point of the site first, or are they going to lead with the landscape? And so, yeah, luckily enough, they, they led with the landscape intervention first, uh, because it is kind of in a, a beloved space, you know, for this good neighbor being kind of a coffee shop hybrid um, commercial space. Uh, and this is like sort of a semi-public um, space for people to hang out. So that's sort of where the design ended up hitting the ground. And, and you know, this ended up being a really important uh, point of reflection, I think, in, in at least thinking about what we we were doing, you know, that we began the design process with this like hyper accurate scan model. Um, we abstracted the work. Um, and, but ultimately, you know, the output of the design project itself ends up being messy, right? I mean, you can see like the earth moving machines. Uh, you can see like the spray paint to lay down the lines. You have like your construction drawing, right? And you're like uh, measuring tape and I think see here. And uh, this is sort of the day one, you know, in a way. And we went back and, and scanned the project. And this is the then the the scan actually textured in this case, uh, but looking at that built project with you know the sort of phase B still left to, to be designed. Um, and then this is the the whole idea of the the post occupancy review in a way. You know, you have your construction drawing, um, and then this is two dimensional line work um, just interpreted. Uh, through a series of, of commands um, for the scan model. And so you can see, you know, there is a, a degree here of variability, right? And so there's this interesting, I think, prompt for us to think about um, with digital tools still being relatively new, you know, in our landscape architecture design process. And this idea that like, you know, I actually think, and of course some of this was revised also on site, right? Um, during construction administration, but the sort of softening of the switchback, for instance, um, you know, I think for the better, but it prompts an interesting question for us to think about in the future of landscape construction as well. Uh, you know, with the rise of large format 3D printing and autonomous um, earth moving vehicles. So you can imagine you, you probably are, are familiar with maybe even these technologies, but certainly at a smaller scale with 3D printers that print you know, resin and um, PLA and these types of materials, but you can actually scale this up. Um, and so you get super highly accurate outputs of the design input itself, right? Uh, similarly, like an earth moving machine operates um, with GPS coordinates, kind of like a CNC milling process that you might be you know, familiar with, it, again, at a smaller scale. And so, you know, do there's this important question of do we want the output of the design we're proposing to be uh, one to one accurate or where is that that wiggle room for sort of the like intrinsic override of, of the human touch on the ground and, and I think that's sort of an important thing for us to reflect on. And so the other project I'll talk about that I ran last semester was a material tectonics course under the theme of habitecture. And the project, you know, or the sort of theme of the course, I guess I should say, came out of uh, we share a building here with entomology. Uh, and at least I don't didn't talk to them very much. And, you know, their doors are always closed. And so there's this like interesting moment of like what happens if we open the doors and, and kind of see their labs and, and talk a little bit. So uh, Dr. Shang Lu Wang uh, was nice enough to sort of collaborate a little bit with us and, and give some lectures and show us their labs. Um, and the idea was really to design um, 
for insects, but we also integrated like the option for like middle species um, as a kind of design option as well. And so these were sort of the clients, you know, for the students. And the idea being, you know, that there's like at least the premise early on was there's like 10 quintillion <laughs> insects in the world and, uh, you know, like 1.4 billion for like every human, <laughs> which is kind of insane. Um, and, you know, the backdrop of this, of course, is against um, this idea of, of, you know, increasing pesticide use, urbanization, and climate change, and what that means sort of on the larger scale for, for our ecosystem, as well as to test, um, you know, some of these notions in, in popular culture with like the bug hotel literature against some of the more um, scientific research. So one of my uh, old professors, Scott MacGyver, for instance, that I worked at the Grit Lab with, does a lot of research on native bees and there's a kind of interesting um, research question of like what types of insects these actually have you know and so to kind of uh, think about that through through design and so the course it, the course basically was structured in very very simple four assignments 25 percent each research design um, build and monitor basically and, you know, another question we were thinking about a little bit is also why is animal architecture itself important? Because um, it says a lot, you know, about like what's going to happen to these species if we don't uh, design for them as well, this sort of um, unseen in a different way. And so here's just a look at some of the more like middle species, uh, some of which are, are insect uh, architecture, but some more like birds and things like that. And there's kind of a question then of like, why do animals uh, create architecture, you know? And, and so there's basically three primary reasons at least, and they're for uh, shelter, they're for communication, and they're to sort of capture or harvest food. And so we, we talked a lot about different species, um, you know, like the bowerbird, the, the caddisfly in the middle, which you can kind of imagine would be, you know, for shelter to protect them. Some for mating rituals and communication. Actually, this one's also about mating rituals. Um, but really sort of inspirational, also beautiful forms that that you know have to do with function as well. Uh, and then there's a, another kind of cultural tie to this as well um, for, the, for the course where we were thinking about our own architecture that we make, um, you know, for animals. So we're looking here at like the dove cot and the dove cut through time, but also through different cultures. And, and so you can see, for instance, like, I believe this is a like World War I dove cut. And also like, why do you, why did we make dove cuts? And it's sort of in a way to have, I mean, at <laughs> one point for food, uh, but it's also to sort of uh, curate in a way where doves go and don't go uh, at some point. And so just to look at formally different interpretations that it can move, uh, what it might look like made out of wood or steel. And to link basically this idea, these are all dove cuts as well in, in different places, but to, to link form and materiality to function, to environmental performance, you know, so why, for instance, would this one be white, um, you know, because of the albedo and to make the building less hot um, in a hot climate, or for instance, this sort of, this seems, you know, quite ornate, this is the um, but this ridge, for instance, is actually to protect the doves from predators so they can't um, climb up. So there's this and you can see it here too right so it's, there's this like ornamentation uh but it has a purpose you know that form has a function these are this one's somewhat local this is in the uh socrates and then two less local ones and and a very very contemporary one here in uh brasilia i believe oscar neymar stuff cut design and these you'll actually see when we tour the building, uh, there's, there's like work in progress stuff pinned up at the top. And then the final, um, the final work, which is I think along this, this back wall on the second floor, but the output basically, and I won't speak to these as much. I, I chose two to quickly flip through, um, but each student chose, um, you know, a species to design for, and then also a kind of way to fabricate it. So it, it bridged from traditional woodworking to 3D printing, which you can see here. So like Sam's, <laughs> who's in the room. Um, this is CNC mill, for instance. So lots of different materials uh, and different forms for different species. Um, and ultimately the idea is that we have this kind of living laboratory or inventory of materials uh, throughout the campus. So something like this, which was partially designed for with PLA and 3D printing, like 
how does that do over a longer uh, time span outdoors, you know, to give us a sense of material performance over time. So the students thought, you know, about a general overview, morphology, in this case, life cycle, uh, their reproduction, also the kind of migration and span of these uh, of the species. And then this is like the design portion of it. So, um, you know, you have this, this object that's somewhat off the shelf and then somewhat custom made, um, in this case, 3D printed by Angie. And just what that sort of behind the scenes look, looks like to actually like fabricate an object, right? Which is something we, we try to do here also in the construction two course. Um, you know, to actually bridge this gap between the digital world where the material materiality is a little difficult to understand and certainly the tectonics of how these materials come together. Uh, and then to sort of grapple and struggle with the fabrication and assembly of the object itself, to think about the siting. And then also to think also again about the monitoring, right? Like often we'll design a project, we'll finish it, and there's not as much thought about what happens then. Uh, so they, they're all challenged to think about a long-term monitoring process uh, for their work. So the last one is sort of a, a, uh, an interesting counterpoint to the idea of habitecture, which is a trap for the spotted lanternfly, which if you're from the area, uh, you know sort of a lot about. Again, just the, these are little booklets. The idea being that whenever the, the course runs, we could sort of check in on these um, a lot of them are cited at Rutgers Gardens, for instance. So here the premise is actually to trap them. Um, but again, the you know, everything from the ecological research of the spotted lantern fly and the material selection of the project is important. So in this case, Lexi, this is a rendering, by the way. Um, you know, everything from the tree of heaven uh, that she had selected to work with is, is sort of loved by the spotted lantern fly and um, Here's just the sort of interior trap mechanism, the process of, of assembling this thing, which you know masquerades as a birdhouse, right? Um, and then the the sort of construction, final assembly of it, the siting, how that integrates then into the, the overall landscape and is mounted at Rutgers Gardens here. Um, and ultimately, this project, you know, ends up being uh, one that hopefully, like Lexi and I, will will get to present at CELA this year. Uh, to evaluate really the success of the project uh, and potential of it in, in the future, you know, as a kind of trap mechanism for the spotted lantern fly. So I think that's kind of more or less my time. I'll, I'll leave it at that, but let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Okay, great. So, um... I think I already introduced myself to everyone. Maybe not. I know you came in. The lights out, Manita Bakshi. I teach in the department. Um, and I'm an architect by training. So I worked in professional architectural practice. And so coming into landscape architecture, I'm not even sure how that happened, but I'm very glad that it did. It's been, I feel like in architecture uh, practice in school, you kind of have your blinders on to the context that's around you. So coming in um, and having the opportunity to work with people in this program has been really great. I like all the different disciplines that are represented by our faculty. So I've had the chance to work obviously with landscape architects like Vincent and Richard, but also with environmental planners and ecologists, um, which has been really great. So I've been working here since 2014 and that I think has really expanded my lens on like kind of what I pay attention to um, and things like that. So let me talk today about my design studio teaching. And then I wanna talk a little bit about the connection between studio teaching and research because I have worked with um, a lot of students, former students, uh, mostly undergrads, but a few grads on um, research um, through grant funded projects that have kind of grown out of studio. Um, so I, I teach, so I used to teach the Viz classes that Vincent now teaches. I teach design studios, I teach an architectural design intro class, and then I teach a research methods class for thesis prep. Um, but uh, I, I've been teaching the Advanced Landscape Architecture Studio, which is for seniors, kind of in the last year of their program. Been doing that for a few years, but definitely in the last five years, I really um, shifted the focus to thinking about how we could partner with communities and the type of work that we could do um, with them. And so my thinking on studio teaching, and I'll just kind of like, maybe I'll come up here, so I think this should all advance. This is the studio we did a year ago with the Western Queens Community Land Trust. 
space in um, Long Island City where they're trying to take over and get from the city the building that was supposed to be Amazon headquarters. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been really kind of thinking about like, how do we partner with communities in different ways? And I think like what that does is that even though it might not necessarily change the deliverables that we typically do and the types of drawings that students create. So you see some examples of those up there. What I, my hope is that it kind of shifts the lens of the designer so that they think a little bit more about like, how do you, um, what, what can you deliver for your client for the studio in a way that's um, gonna benefit, you know, their further goals. So with this group, with the WQCLT, um, we give them like the booklet of design ideas, which they're using in some of their conversations with the city as they're trying to, um, you know, take over the building that you see over here. And then also to make some changes along the entire Western Queens community, um, along the Western Queens waterfront. So they want to have it be redeveloped in a way that connects NYCHA residents to um, the waterfront, but they want to talk to the city about that. So it's useful to have some ideas to kind of show them. Um, another, this is from 2020. So we partnered with, um, just pull this up. We partnered with um, this guy here, Tobias Fox, who's the um, founder and director, director of um, Newark Science and Sustainability. And so what we wanted to do was, you know, for me, I wanted to make sure I'm fulfilling the goals of the studio. So the students are learning what they need to be learning. But also after the studio concluded, Tobias wanted to put together a conference, which we partnered on called Renew Newark, where we brought together um, like four of the students from the studio, no, three students from the studio presented, along with people from the Newark Community Food, Newark Community Food System Network and then professional architects. So um, just kind of trying to think about how we can contribute to projects beyond the end of the semester and of the studio. So just kind of go to some publications I've done in the last few years. You're gonna kind of see some of these images here because I've also tried to continue work with um, studio partners and like research projects and things like that. So I'm gonna share a lot more. And that's the one project I'm gonna kind of go into detail about um, is this project called Our Land, Our Stories, which started out as a Praxis, which is a special topic studio in 2018. And then we kind of continued to go on and, and do other things. Um, and then I'm also sort of working on um, with this group called the Society and Design Lab with my research partner, who you see here, who's a sociologist um, here at Rutgers. And so this is a recent trip we did to New Mexico, but our overall project is thinking about um, making people more central to the design process. And how can we encourage design students to think more about that? So we've kind of developed a series of um, proposals for design exercises and things like that that can kind of make that happen. So you can probably tell um, from here kind of what my main interests are. It's like working with people and working with communities and things like that. Um, so I wanted to talk in a little bit more detail about this project called Our Land, Our Stories. Been working on it since uh, 2018 with um, community partners from the Ramapo Lenape Nation and Native American community based in North Jersey, where many folks in that community are still living on an active Superfund site. So highly contaminated site, remediation is ongoing. And um, it started as a studio project and I'm still working on it, but it's kind of getting closer to done in the sense that we've hit some key deliverables we wanted to do, like this digital exhibit, which I'll walk you through, which is um, online with Rutgers University Libraries. And we're trying to connect teachers, university teachers, high school teachers, middle school teachers to this as a curriculum resource so that um, students can learn about Native American history, which many of us just don't learn a lot about at all in schools, and also relationships to land for indigenous communities, um, and then environmental justice issues. So that's where I'm kind of trying to think about also like how can we as like architects, designers, landscape architects create other deliverables than the drawings and stuff, or like bring the drawings into other things. So we have this exhibit. Um, we've also done some, uh, pop-up exhibits in a few different places. Um, so we have this, these boards, um, this was shown in the Newark Public Library in 2019, and it's kind of gone to a few other places. And then we also have a documentary film called The Meaning of the Seed. And then um, this book, which is kind of hot off the presses just from a few <laughs> months ago, 
And inside I have like a, a fundraising flyer. So we want to sell this as a fundraiser um, for this community. So as I'm, as I'm talking, you can kind of pass it along, pass around, look through it. If you want to buy a copy of the book as a fundraiser, <laughs> you can Venmo me at the end of the day today. Um, <laughs> So um, yeah, I thought I'd just kind of tell you a little bit more about this project and kind of give you some visuals as to what I mean by like other deliverables or just other ways of working with community. So into this digital exhibit are a lot of the graphics that you're gonna see in the book and in the exhibit with the traditional printed boards. But I also wanted to create this kind of digital version to make the information digestible in different ways. So we used, this digital exhibit building program called Omeka, um, which is available through Rutgers University Libraries. And it gives you kind of limited options on what you could do. Like a lot of the exhibits they have are kind of static and like, here's a document and like, here's the text. So I wanted to kind of experiment with how can we make it more visual? Because I think, you know what, I really want to do with this kind of data, you know, that Diana was talking about data as well, right? how do we present it in ways that make it legible and so people can decipher it and so it doesn't remain kind of a mystery because you can find out a lot of data and a lot of information but actually navigating it is difficult so we use some kind of cool plugins in omeka to create um, different kinds of maps so you can um, kind of navigate through this way and then you can also just go say like oh what is this there's a site related to native american history by camden Kind of what it what is it and kind of connect to it in that way um and then there's like more static maps which we placed into the book so different like non-western or non-european ways of representing land and territory and kind of trying to think about that a little bit um uh, just kind of clarifying where where are the super fun sites there are so many in new jersey mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and, and then in the digital exhibit, there's also links to like, hey, you can do a search here and find out like where a super fun site is uh, near where you live and stuff like that. Um, and then we also tried to do, try to find a more interesting way to kind of present the timelines, which they are represented in the book, in the, in the physical exhibit. It's nice because it's like this huge board and so you can like look at all the dates, but like putting this on a digital format is not so interesting. So we tried to um kind of bring in this is another plugin for Omeka through this company called Night Lab where you can kind of plug in a lot of cool stuff so we made this timeline there and so you can look through and say like what are these important things that we all should know about Native American land and the history in the U.S. with like links and images and then you can also navigate let's see you can also navigate just through the timeline bar and like find things that interest you like oh what is the what is the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act? And kind of navigate it that way. So just want to give like people more interactive options um, as you're learning this, that it shouldn't get like kind of dull and, and boring or static or anything like that. So that's where we used a few plugins um, to sort of explain this information. And you can even into these timelines, you can even embed videos into it. That's very loud, so I won't let it play. But <laughs> <laughs> the intro to the super fun cleanup uh, website also just gives you a little video, like what is a super fun site? So we're really trying to make um, things very, very legible. Um, so those are kind of links in the digital exhibit, and then we also wanted to offer, you know, just an overview of the project and kind of the work that we did here. Um, here I'm kind of highlighting what the goals are. Like we really want to communicate that environmental and scientific data, but in a way that makes it easy and illustrating connections between this one particular site and environmental justice issues all over the country, right? Like how is this affecting all kinds of different communities? Um, definitely wanted to make it clear that our partners who we co-created this work with are not just like passively accepting this, this you know, um, the damage that's been done to their land, like they're very actively working against it and then wanting to connect that to um, environmental movements that are being done by other indigenous groups and communities. And um, also we really wanted to emphasize how colonial perspectives and biases in who have been the researchers and historians about this community have impacted how they've been um, kind of perceived by others and by outsiders. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the book in the digit, uh, digital exhibit about the partners that we worked with 
you know, photos of the landscape. We partnered with researchers in environmental medicine from NYU and kind of incorporated some of their research on water quality and health impact. But my favorite parts are the um, recordings of conversations that we have with community elders and community leaders. And all of, almost all of the work that you'll see in the book is done by former students who are, did like these amazing sketches while people were talking and kind of recording their stories. Um, so I think that's the, the part that I'm happiest about that we kind of included and were able to capture um, in the book. We have, you know, kind of records from some of the community engagement events and the storytelling sessions. And what I like about, um, what I like about this format is that I can keep adding to it. You know, as more research comes up, as we do more events, record more videos, we can keep adding to it. So it's it's a living archive. It's not a static thing. And definitely have invited my um, community partners to, um, you know, just tell me, like, when do they want a new exhibit? What's the inf new information that they kind of want to share to it? Um, so I want to maybe just walk you through a couple of the exhibits. So there's... With many things you do at Rutgers, sometimes you have to have like the Rutgers logo thing. But once we go into the exhibits, we'll get into a nicer format where that uh, where that sort of um, goes away. So the first exhibit um, that you start with is, as I mentioned before, the community stories. Um, and we have, let me go maybe to Wayne's story, kind of like these overall spreads that you see in the book. And then kind of zoom ins and the words that um, Wayne Mann was saying. So this is stuff that we developed more so for Instagram, you know, to make like, you know, little sections because always, I think, have to be aware of the format and the audience. So something that's going to work in a big print on the wall is going to be really different in the book is really going to be different for someone who's looking at it on their phone. So I think that's one of the things I'm always trying to get students to think about is like, who's your audience and how can you reach them? and use the special skills that you have because you are a landscape architect and an artist and a designer to create visuals that'll have um, more impact. So always kind of trying to think about that audience. Um, so this exhibit has all these stories. I'm gonna take you then into the history exhibit. So we really wanted to develop this, as I said, as a resource for teachers who can, you know, kind of use it in a number of different ways. There's even like a teaching resources tab and just wanted to kind of start with acknowledging how little we know about Native American history. Um, and so some of this stuff is, is about land and history and how land, you know, became territory and was sold. Um, and then we talk more specifically about the history in New Jersey um and the Ramapo Lenape and here's a fun I just want to show this fun another fun plugin um I found for this um which is like we kind of wanted to highlight here's the history you know the told history and here's the untold thing and I found this cool slider thing where you can kind of you know kind of see this and that because I wanted to like something active that you could do with your you know as you're touching the screen to think about what's revealed and what's not revealed and then, you know, later on, you can scroll down and see the images in their entirety and find more information about sort of what's conveyed there. Um, but I think that's a big, a big goal here is kind of revealing these things that we don't know. And we also included essays by uh, community partners where we could expand on the information in the book. So um, this is Chuck Stead. He actually saw them dumping um, the paint sludge that contaminated their, uh, the Ramapo lands when he was a little kid in the 60s and 70s. And so in the exhibit, I'm able to just include a lot more information. Like there he is as a little kid. Here's his sketchbook as he's drawing like this bulldozer digging a trench as they are like polluting the land. So um, the exhibit also gives a lot more options for like extending the life of the project and adding more things in. Um, and then I just kind of write about, um, this is a, a photograph from the studio of when we first started the project and what the process was like and how we kind of started this all as a class. And then from there, um, I applied for and received some grants from the New Jersey Council for the Humanities, which allowed for like the funding and the printing of the book and all these other elements um, to kind of move forward. Um, the community exhibit, this one kind of dives into something like we might not normally think of as within the scope of designer, but like looking at and revealing how this community 
was represented in a really derogatory way um, from, and here I have another slider, from like early newspaper reports. This is from 1921 about wild men living in commuting distance only 30 miles away from Manhattan to uh, Weird New Jersey, which some of you might know as a website in a book, which um, uh, published something about this community in 2012 and just showing like the connections and the ongoing, um, ongoing, how like these ongoing kind of misperceptions were created. And we also wanted to use kind of some non-traditional media. I know this is going to be loud, but I kind of want to play just like a little bit of this uh, video clip here. This is um, with a uh, current grad student, Kathleen Hammerdahl. She worked on creating this, so I thought it would be a fun one to see. I don't know if you're going to maybe meet her in the studio upstairs. And this is using Adobe After Effects to like go through those different documents and then include video footage to kind of show how this um, history of misrepresentation worked. Mm -hmm. turn the music low and then I can just kind of talk over it because there's no dialogue or anything. But the goal here was to take, you know, how do you make documents and articles and quotes kind of interesting and engaging? So that's where we were kind of experimenting with, you know, what can we do in terms of, um, you know, animating the numbers and letters and then also bringing in like video footage. So this is like a book um, that had a derogatory depiction of the Ramapo and then kind of like zooming into that and putting the text on the screen. It's kind of looking at, you know, those kinds of options. And then we kind of go into um, how that plays a role in more recent years with the um, Indian Gaming Regulatory Act and the impact that that had on communities um, and them being believed or not if they are Native American. Um, so we wanted to kind of like connect what happened in the past to, you know, kind of current political dynamics when we think about, um, you know, legislation and things like that. Kind of exit out of this. And then um, here's some of the kind of like timelines that you see in the book. And we just sort of found ways to bring some dynamism and kind of animate those as well so that it becomes a more interesting sort of viewing experience when you're looking at it. Um, the contamination exhibit, this one here goes into maybe what we would think about a little bit more um, in terms of uh, landscape architecture. So it has some of the details and the documentation about what was contaminated, um, also about like how um, how the land was polluted and, you know, how the um, contaminated materials were dumped on the site. And I'm out of time, but I just want to show you one more thing, just to end on a positive note, you know, the flora and fauna section, we talked about the impact this had on the food web, but then we also um, have a whole section that highlights um, this farm that was created in 2020, which is part of a food sovereignty project by the Ramapo and the efforts that they're making um, to kind of work towards food sovereignty in their community. So that's another thing I was thinking about a lot in putting this project together is like, how do we balance that information that's very difficult to engage with and very depressing, but like not make people just say, I don't want to deal with it. I'm going to walk away from it. And I think like beauty, aesthetics, visually engaging materials are really helpful in getting people to pay attention. Um, and hopefully we're going to be able to, you know, raise some money for the farm through the project. So Hopefully, I'm ending on a more positive note uh, than I started. Thank you. Any questions for you? Where are you with the project now? You have something tomorrow, don't you? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, invitation for everybody. We're doing um, a film screening. We made a documentary film that we filmed at the farm called The Meaning of the Sea. And it's screening tomorrow at Rutgers Gardens. Beautiful place to visit that our department is very connected to. It's that 
from 2.30 to 3.30. Um, and you can look uh, for information at the meeting of this at meeting of this um, Instagram or Facebook where we have all the information about that. But it should be, I was worried when we planned it that that would be cold, but I think it's going to be a really beautiful <laughs> and really gorgeous day to sort of be out oh, there. No. Yeah. So everyone's welcome to come. Thanks, Anita. Yeah. So, um, so there's still some. If anybody, there's still some goodies over next door. If you want to grab those, and I'll just we'll just do a quick walk through upstairs through the studio. Is that is that good for you folks? Are you folks to do that? Are you good? All righty. Well, let's do that.